Hi! Uh, this is Janet Fitch, and it is noon on Wednesday, and so it must be Writing Wednesday, where I answer your writing questions and uh, try to help you uh, leapfrog over some of the uh, some of the pitfalls and potholes in the road. Um, answering your questions and uh, feel free if you have questions for me as we go along uh, leave them in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I am getting ready for Thanksgiving and as you know I am a great believer in uh, guests doing some of the work. Uh, you know they they don't expect me to be uh, the caterer um, so uh, Everybody's bringing something, and uh, so there's an element of surprise always involved, and a, uh, a mystery guest, which is great. There should always be a mystery guest at Thanksgiving, friend of a friend. Um, makes it fun. Uh, also, I'm getting ready to um, teach my um, class, in my weekend intensive in dialogue for fiction writers through the community of writers, and that'll be the 3rd, 4th, and 5th of December, so uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, uh, to deal with the difficulty of the dialogue scene, uh, which is agents and editors will tell you the thing that they wish that more writers were doing better at the dialogue scene. And what makes a good dialogue scene, what makes good dialogue, and then what how do you make the scene out of the dialogue that people are speaking? So there's a micro and a macro uh, element involved there. Uh, and we'll be dealing with both at length. I love this class. It's really fun because I can see people overcoming years and years of just not knowing that there's a problem with their dialogue. And once they see it, they never go back. Hi, Krista. Oh, from Santa Fe. Is it snowing there yet? Um, yeah, I love love Southwest. I love that that red earth. Uh, uh, it's one of my favorite places. As a matter of fact, here in my bat cave, I have a picture I get to look at all the time, which is red dirt. I happen to love red dirt. And so, uh, oh, it's raining. <sighs> Yay, Tony! Hi. Yeah, so I'm teaching a this dialogue workshop, um, uh, third, fourth, and fifth. It's an intensive. Uh, I like intense things, and uh, so we get to do it all at once. Um, so I have two questions for today from uh, from uh, my viewers, and you can write questions in the dialogue, or if you send me questions through my website, janetfitchwrites.com, there's a contact form. If you send, uh, send me questions in advance, things that you're interested in, I can design a Writing Wednesday around your question. Uh, I love to do it, and uh, it keeps everybody fresh and gets your questions answered. So here is my question for today, the first question is from Amy. Uh, if Amy is uh, on the call today, um, uh, Amy says that she was planning on writing on NaNoWriMo like hell this year. Okay, NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month, and um, where a bunch of writers decide that they're going to write 50,000 50, words uh, in a month. Um, and the idea is, you know, you write a novel in a month. Well, can write 50,000 words, but, uh, you know, whether or not that's a novel is another. <laughs> but the question, the, the point is, is that it allows you to um, think of your writing in a very serious way and commit time, commit time to really seeing what it would be like if you put all of your energy into your writing. What would it be like to be that kind of writer? It gives you a taste of what it is to be a really committed writer. And it's very easy to tell everybody to leave you alone. It's NaNoWriMo. You know, I'm not going to, this month is for me. And then the holidays come and blah, blah, blah. Um, so NaNoWriMo is great to 
kind of declare yourself uh, a more committed writer and you can tailgate off of that energy. Uh, so anyway, Amy is doing NaNoWriMo, was very excited, but I simply cannot seem to get started. Every time I sit down, I end up with maybe two pages, then start an entirely new project the next day because I doubt the previous one. And the pattern has been going on for years. I have a tangible idea in mind, but I guess I just don't know how to progress from the first scene outward, onward. Any advice? Well, this is, this is very, uh, very sad and uh, many a writer can identify with this one. Um, you have an idea, you sit down, you write two pages, and you just don't know where to go with that. So you go to the next day, and you start something else, and you write two pages, and you go to the next day, and you don't know what to write. So you write two pages, and then write the next day. So it tells me a couple of things. One is... Why don't you write short shorts for a while and just write two pages, you know, intend to write two pages double spaced, um, intend to write a short short, and then you're not disappointing yourself all over the place. That's an idea. I always, I often do the word exercises. Somebody, um, uh, I'm sure that you guys, anybody who's worked with me uh, recognizes this. I'll take a word that's a could be a um, verb or noun, and um, often it's those great words that are both were you know that can be taken both ways, and write two pages double spaced using that word somewhere in it and being inspired by the word, and see what comes out. You know, make a list of all the associations with that word, and then just pick one that seems to resonate the most with you. And then write two pages, double space, using that word. And then just, you know, if you want to do that for a month, and just write those exercises, write those short shorts, you'll find that one of them, or more, you know, you'll have 30 of them, 30 short shorts that you can publish as short, you can work on them and publish them as short shorts. You can expand them. If you feel that one of them has, you know, wants more room, it's like there's more to be said. I haven't said everything I want to say about this in these two pages. Then that becomes a short story and you work on that short story. Then it gets to the point where if there's more to that short story, that it's like, you know, I have more to me here then that becomes a longer work, perhaps a novel, the beginning of a novel. Every novel I've ever written has come from this exercise. You can do it with, you can do exercise two pages with photograph, write yourself into the photograph. What's going on? Who, who am I in the photograph? What's, what's the story? Uh, so anybody who has this problem that Amy's having, don't, think about how to make it longer, think about, and then disappointing yourself. Oh God, I can only get a first, you know, first chapter. Well, think of that that's it. That's what you're trying to do. Write short. That's my first, uh, my second, uh, I guess, piece of advice is, you know, try the short shorts, try the little exercises. If something feels like it needs more elbow room, it wants to get bigger, then let it get bigger. Then when you, you know, if you've written a short story, then you can see, is there more to that? There's more to that story. You know, you've written maybe 10 short stories out of 30 short shorts, maybe eight. Then maybe one of them, it, you know, you keep coming back to, you keep thinking, gee, I, I'd like to see more of that then that can become a longer project. So that's the first half of the answer to that question. The second half is when you write it, you lose interest in it. And my feeling is if you write it and you lose interest in it, then that's, that should tell you something. 
you know, I've said what I want to say about it, or as I start to say something about it, it turns out I don't really care. Good to know. Good to know, right? You don't want to spend years on something that actually you don't really care that much about. So uh, I think the Nano Remo uh, puts people in a panic. It's like, oh my God, oh my God, I didn't plan on what I was going to use this time for. And now I'm just coughing up first chapters or first scenes of something. I'm in a panic, okay? So this is something you can address once NaNoWriMo is over. It's almost over, right? We have one more week. Um, or next time if you start early. But generally, as a writer, um, is if you're going to have some free time coming up or you're planning on doing a big sprint like that, or if you're going on a retreat, do some planning. Don't undertake it until you figured out what is grabbing you that you want to work on because you believe me if you get a if you get a residency and you go to the residency and you have you don't know what you're gonna work on you could spend I could spend three weeks or the full month just not knowing what to do with myself not a good use of your time so I'm a great believer in using the, the short shorts, using the little exercises, writing a lot of them, and then seeing what calls to you, seeing what grabs you. So the third part of this is the pattern has been going on for years. I, I start an entirely new project the next day because I doubt the previous one. And the pattern has been going on for years. Okay, so this is a big question now. We're getting into the um, doubting whatever it is I'm doing and starting something new. If I wrote a, say, two-page opener of a scene, why would I be... It seems overly harsh to decide that it's not going anywhere and I'm going to start something new. <laughs> there was a reason that you started this. There's a reason this interested you. It, it stimulated something inside, deep memory, a, an issue that you have that inspired you to write this thing in the first place. Try to find the connection between that and what I call the neck down. We've talked about neck up and neck down writing. Neck up is like, ooh, cool idea. Doesn't have anything to do with you. It's just a cool idea, you know, big concept. Um, but if you come out of what you're made of, you know, I'd like to do a, um, you know, I'd like to, oh, let's do a story about a monster that comes crawling out of your ears. You know, it's like, yeah, I could see writing that and going, yeah, I don't know about that. that. That didn't seem to tell me anything. Whereas if I take it, if I take a word and I pull out of my own associations with those words and I find a short short and I write a short short about it. I'm already tapping into the below the neck stuff, the stuff that my paint box is loaded with. Like here, I keep all the word, I write down a bunch of words that I, that are both, usually both nouns and verbs, simple words that are really good to do this word exercise with. So there's my little bag of tricks. And I just picked a, randomly picked a word. And my example is going to be cradle. So cradle, you can cradle something or something can be a cradle, so verb and noun. So I make a list of my associations with cradle. So put your phone back on the cradle. In the olden days, there was a solid piece of the phone and then you, uh, then you put the receiver portion back in the little prong section that was called the cradle. So there's that cradle. You know, there's cradling an infant, you cradle a watermelon, you cradle the cat, you know, 
holding it in their arms like that. There's the cradle, a, an actual physical cradle, of which there can be all kinds. I know somebody who makes little boats. She's a boat, you know, makes little, makes cradles like little boats. I think, wow, that's kind of cool. Maybe I could do something with that. Um, uh, you know, rocking the cradle. The cradle will rock. You know, rockabye babies, kind of scary. Uh, lullaby, as many of them are, I think they help mothers get rid of their aggression towards their small children. <laughs> um, cradle, the cradle of civilization, you know, um, the Tigris and Euphrates. Um, uh, uh, what other cradles are there? Uh, you cradle your hands. This. Um, cats in the cradle. Ugh. You know, that's a song, and there's also, you know, and the story that that sets off in your mind. Um, and then you make a list of these associations with cradle. What's another cradle? Um, so I love the cats in the cradle. That's good. And then you think, what stimulates me the most of those ideas? Maybe it's the boat. Maybe I'm going to want to do the boat. So then I write two pages, double space, using the word cradle in there somewhere. And then I have tapped into the unconscious. It's like a Rorschach to do these word exercises because it comes from an unconscious place. It taps the unconscious and it opens up who you are. So it's not, you know, neck up stories or constructs. It's what happens in the unconscious, neck down stuff, that really makes your attachment to it strong. If you have a good attachment to something, you're not gonna walk away from it the next day and go, you know, why Why was I interested in that? It's like, because that's what I'm made of. You know, you don't ask yourself that question. When you're, when you're linked into who you are as a person, your moral issues, your fears, your obsessions, um, you don't walk away from those. So I say work more neck down, do little writing exercises, do the word exercise, and uh, wait for the piece that wants to stretch, wants to be bigger. You know, you're not done with it in two pages. You know, so you try, maybe you, you try four pages. Oh, there's more there. Mm you know, six pages. Are we done yet? You know, it might be a 12-page short story. It might be a 24-page short story. You know, then get the story, the short story, or the, and the, a bigger story if you feel it has, uh, it's, it wants the elbow room. So you are listening to what you've already done. You're not this is not about ideas. This is about the material starting to come up. Uh, then you can, if there's still more in that short story, you know, send it out, get it published. If there's still more, maybe that's the novel. And you won't be walking away from it. If it's made out of you, if you put yourself into it and your concerns and your fears and your vulnerabilities and, you know, things about your past and your worldview and problems that you're struggling with and angels and devils of your own psyche, you, you don't walk away from that. That, that is really interesting. So it's, it's how do you hook in to your inner issues rather than thinking, how can I produce pages for NaNoWriMo? NaNoWriMo is just a venue. It's just a, a leap, you know, a kind of a springboard. But it's not about the content that you're bringing up. It's just, uh, it gives you a framework to say, the, this month I'm going to dedicate to this in a very intense way. But you'll continue after it's done. You're still a writer. You've just been using it to, to leap off. Hi, Zunaid. So Zunaid says, here's my challenge with continuing. I sit with myself, I hold the image in my mind and try to figure out the characters and their conflicts with each other. And I write notes about it to help me. 
as if they were patients on a therapist's couch. And then when I start writing the fiction, they fade out of my mind. Hmm. Well, that's, that's really good. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I talk to my characters all the time. I have a character now uh, in something I'm working on who was very one-dimensional or two-dimensional. And I keep thinking about him. And I've found out all kinds of stuff about him. Uh, he's not talking to me yet. But uh, in feeling him, in feeling his, my way into him. I am a character, uh, says Edmund. You were probably many characters. I mean, we're, a novel or a story is like a dream in which everybody in the dream is you, is a part of you. So when you write a story, you're taking parts of yourself and you're assigning, you know, it's like, this will be my brashness, this character. This character is going to be all of my cowardice. This character is going to be all my braggadocio. This character is going to be all of my yearning. And you tease out the pieces of yourself and then you let them interact. You know, I think that's what most writers do. Yeah, Annie Diller, the self, as Zunaid says, Annie Diller, the self is the bearer of the paint box of its fears, obsessions, and fascinations. That's right. You know, we paint out of this material that we're made out of. Um, okay, so my that's my advice to Amy. I hope she's on the call. If not, she might watch it later. I am posting uh, videos uh, onto my YouTube channel, Janet Fitch's Writing Wednesday YouTube. So go ahead and like me over there um, because it's easier to find videos over there. And if I ever like decide that I can't deal with Mark Zuckerberg anymore, uh, I might be doing more stuff uh, over at YouTube. So please follow me there so you can uh, continue with Writing Wednesday, regardless of venue. Um, now we have another question. This one is from Sylvia. Now, Sylvia, I don't know if you're on the call, um, but I imagine that you uh, will be watching this uh, later on. And she asks, what is the story you feel compelled to tell over and over in all your stories and novels? Okay. That's very interesting. Um, the story I tell over and over again, I like, I think my subject matter is how people create a, the, how do they create a their kind of a, their moral universe? How do they mature in terms of kind of struggling with um, what they believe to be true about the world? You know, the honest, the good struggle with life and the development of a, a person in their moral universe, mostly women. Uh, so far, young women, so far, although my current uh, protagonist in the book I'm working on is a 57-year-old woman who, in her way, you know, is a case of arrested development. And it's like everybody has to go through this to become a mature human being. And so many of us die without ever having done that work. But that's what, that's what literature is for is to open our eyes, you know, maybe we didn't even realize that that was something that we should be thinking about. Wow, I had never had those ideas before. Or I've had those ideas and I've never really taken the time to follow them through. I mean, I know myself, unless I'm writing, I often miss the big picture myself. 
I don't take the time to sit and puzzle it out, which is one of the great things about being a writer, is it gives me a reason to look again, to think harder. And in writing, you can really move through an idea, whereas I don't know about you, but me, when I'm just thinking about something, I'm thinking, I think in f like little flashes, but they, they don't really have the power of one thinking something through. I need to think it through on the page. It's too, it, it's too jellyish, you know, too diaphanous, uh, in my mind. And then I get interrupted and I go somewhere else. But if I'm on the page, I could think things through and come up with what I really think. Also, the nice thing about fiction writing is what happens on the page is not what I want to believe. But it's always what I actually believe. So there's a gap between like who I think I am and who I really am. And what happens on the page is what I really am. Because that's what I really, how I really think the world works. And I, in general, you know, for those of you who've read me know that you know me differently than my friends, you know, the people I know in life, my next door neighbors and my, you know, my friends, my colleagues or whatever, they know your social interactions. And if you have good manners and like people, you know, your social interactions can be very pleasant. But when you get onto the page is when you tell how you really what you really think the world is and how you really think it works. And so it's much more complex and in my case, generally probably a lot darker than I am in real life, in my outer life. So the reader knows the writer better in a certain way than anybody in their life because you know more about what that person really thinks and not just being Pollyanna. I try to be very Pollyanna in real life. You know, I try to, ah, it's going to be okay. You know, I try to watch out for the doom and gloom and, you know, be encouraging for people who everybody's hurting. But on the page, you have to be honest. What do I really think happens in that situation? What do I really think goes on? Um, so there's an honesty on the page. Uh, I'm not saying I'm dishonest, but I, in life, I, I edit what reaches other people. You know, what's going to be useful for them. Whereas on the page, I go into that space and I, I'm going like, you know, what really happens here? What do I really believe? This new book is a I call it a comedy. My husband, who is a comedy writer, says this is not a comedy. <laughs> um, it's not a comedy, you know, that you're going to sell to Netflix, that's for sure. But it's funny. I have character, two characters, a mother and a daughter, who are just, they, they're funny people. They think funny things. They're just... Um, Am I a realist? Um, uh, Chris asks, am I a realist? Probably in, in the balance between pessimism and optimism. Uh, I'm, I'm probably a realist or I'm more of a, an optimistic pessimist. <laughs> if such a thing. <laughs> well, spending the time in Russia in, in the last in Marina M and uh, um, and uh, Chimes of Lost Cathedral, spending a lot of time with Marina. Um, the Rush, there's a stoic element about the Russians, um, which as a Californian, it's been very interesting because as a Californian, you want you want everything to really work out. I mean, to really really work out. You know, and you believe in the future and you believe that if we do the right things, you know, we'll move towards a better world. And, you know, I mean, we don't want to live with 
it as garbage. We don't want to live a garbage life. We don't want to live with crap and just put up with it. Whereas the Russians are, you know, or at least my Russians and like people I know and my characters and stuff. I mean, there's a much more of a sense of life is going to be really hard and you just, there's a lot of crap you're going to put up with. And Russian humor is really interesting. Um, because it's so much about like, this is what, how we live. This is, they're asking me to do this stuff and it's my brother and I guess I'm gonna do it. God, read Devlatov, uh, The Suitcase. What a brilliant book and so funny. And it's this, this humor, it's kind of gallows humor about life, about life. Um, but uh, there's also a, a deep feeling of tenderness about life and how precious it is and the closeness of other people. Um, anyway, so my comedy is, is sort of a bit of a Russian comedy. <laughs> if nobody dies, it's a comedy. Does anybody die? I don't think so. Not yet. <laughs> Well, is there anything else we can talk about? We need women's coming of age stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, coming of age stories where people are trying to really engage with the big issues um, and uh, considering, considering the, considering the implications. Uh, Edmund says, as an East Coaster, I totally don't get California, but I do get Russia. Yeah, California, we really want things to work out, and we really believe we can. We really believe that we can make it work. <laughs> Remains to be seen. <laughs> Have I watched Blue Jasmine? No, I haven't. What's Blue Jasmine? Well, obviously, a a movie of some sort. Um, no, but I did see Dune yesterday. I've I've been looking forward to seeing it, and it was it was a very fun three hours. I I I've got to say, I now I need to read Dune. I got to put it on my list. I haven't read sci-fi for a while. So um, anyway, do we have any other writing questions? Um, Oh, they're shooting my film. They're shooting. They're going to be shooting. Uh, they've got the money. They're ready to go uh, to shoot The Method, the uh, um, noir, L.A. noir uh, uh, story that I wrote. Uh, they've been optioning it for years, and it looks like they're going to production. So I'll let you know. It's probably going to be January, uh, and I'll let you know who they cast and all that, because I'm I'm waiting too. It's the third movie. It's very exciting for me. Um, even though I didn't write it, I didn't do <laughs> I didn't do anything for it. It's like being a grandparent. You know, it's like if the kids if it's it's like you get all the pleasure of this little kid and then you don't have to do anything. Um Yeah, the film thing is always really fun. Uh I think dialogue is the reason that I've had three movies made or having three movies made from my work um, is I don't write dialogue for the screen. I write dialogue for the page, but the scenes are, I mean, that's the most vivid writing that you can do is a hot dialogue, so, you know, real time dialogue scene. Dialogue makes the scene, um, makes time not stop, but go into real time. You know, you you can move time along very quickly in the exposition. You know, in winter, turn to summer, turn to fall. But the minute you say, and she said, Phew, you're right there in the room. And, uh, you know, we're going to explore all those concepts. So you have another week to sign up for that. Uh, that'll be uh, the third through the fifth the community of writers dot org and you'll find it there um, 
Oh, blue, blue uh, jasmine is a Woody Allen uh, classic. I think you'd love it. Protagonist in it, Kate Blanchett won the Oscar for that award. Well, take it up, take a look at it. There's all kinds of good things out right now. I, I'm starting to go to the movies <clears throat> with a mask on, you know, the first movie of the day and, you know, trying to avoid, you know, the covidity uh, while uh, getting some movie attention. I'm judging a, uh, a screenplay, um, adapted screenplay thing. Uh, so I get to see all the adapted and see how they change the books. And, um, I feel like adaptation is such an interesting art, um, to take something big and unruly like a novel and then sculpt it. So it fits in that little package called a, you know, two hour movie. Um, it's a special art. I think film is more of a short story medium. That, that it's easier to expand a short story into a film than it is to cut a big novel down into a film. That's a tough one. How did I, Ed, Ed let's see. Uh, let's see. Edmund says, how did I not know Paint It Black became a movie? Must watch now. Yeah, it's beautiful. Amber Tamblyn uh, directed it. And Janet McTeer um, uh, played the mother. It was uh, quite a substantial thing. Aliyah Shawkat played Josie, and yeah, it's it's very exciting. You know, as a as a fiction writer, that's a world I only experience tangentially. But I'm a big movie watcher too. Um, I had to learn how to write fiction, especially the dialogue scene. People have seen a lot of dialogue in movies. Not so many people watch plays, but in movies and plays, but dialogue on the page is a whole order of complexity uh, further along than, uh, than dialogue in film. But we can learn a lot, from, especially from good actors, ugh, good directors. We can learn a lot to uh, take over into our fiction writing, um, timing, rhythm, framing of the scene, you know, what do you describe, what do you not describe, uh, pacing. Uh, I saw it with a film editor, uh, Dune, and that was, I, I, I love talking to her about film editing. Um, there's so much that we can learn about writing from a f film editing. Uh, which is all about pace and, and order of things. What order do you tell things in? Uh, what do you leave out? What don't you need? You know, everything in a film, in a shot, has a reason. You know, so how about your dialogue? Does everything in there have a reason? Here's a question. Whoa, this is Zunaid. Would love for me and Amber Tamlin one day to do a Writing Wednesday together on Zoom or something about her adaptation. I'll let her know. I'll let her know. There's a lot of articles. I mean, we've done things together like that. So, um, you know, take a look on the interwebs. Um, the adaptation was probably, she took maybe about half of the book to adapt. So it'd be very interesting to talk to her about what her choices were, what to take and what to leave. Whereas a novel, you can have it all. It doesn't have to fit into 90 minutes. You know, you can open side door, you can open doors on the side, you can look in the cupboards, you know. That's what I like. Um, anyway, so wishing you a happy Thanksgiving. If you want to uh, um, uh, sign up for the uh, dialogue intensive, uh, you have a week to do it, uh, communityofwriters.org. And uh, hope if you're doing NaNoWriMo, hope that's that worked out for you. And uh, we'll have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll talk next week. Okay, bye.